Good morning, church. I hope you're having a blessed day today. It makes me so excited just to bring you the Word of God every single day. As we're going through John 13 through 17, we are, we're just going thematically. We're kind of going not exactly verse by verse, but we're looking at section after section in, the, in, the, in these five chapters. It's the, it's the final discourse. It's the final teaching of Jesus before he goes to the cross. So we want to make sure that we really meditate on these teachings because there's so much truth in them. There's so much truth in this. We've stayed in chapter 14 for a couple days now. We're going to finish out in these last couple verses. There's some powerful truth in here that I want to bring out. And then tomorrow, I hope you're excited because tomorrow is chapter 15. And chapter 15 discusses the vine dresser or the, the husbandman. We're talking about the father as the vineyard dresser, the, the man who prunes. It, it's, it's, it's one of the greatest understandings in the Word of God if you understand the pruning of the Lord, Him bringing you back to launch you even further so you can produce more fruit, the, the temperance of the Lord, the, the, the immense wisdom of God in your life. And if, you're, if you see it as that, you're willing to, to, to let him flow through you. It's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. And we're gonna, I, I know I say that about all of these promises because they, they all are great in my opinion. They all are great. The red letter, it's Jesus. It's, it's, it's so amazing when you can get the revelation of the word and the word come alive inside of you, produce outwardly in you, not just in your in your mind, but in your emotions, in your will, it changes how you you act towards other people. It changes how you act towards God. It, cha it changes how you resist temptation and and get through persecution. And it changes your your body, because in the Word is life and health. It's it's just powerful truth, church. So today we're gonna read John fourteen twenty seven through thirty one. We're gonna read read the last part of this chapter. There's a lot of different teachings we're going to go into. We're going to really pull out some truth out of this. So let me pray. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I pray everybody under the sound of my voice, their eyes be open to see, their ears be open to hear, their hearts be open to receive the word of life, the spiritual seed sown deep inside. God, let it produce in our bodies, in our mind, our will, and our emotions, transforming us by the renewing of our mind, conforming us into the image of Christ, teaching us to grow in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, I love you, and I thank you for all that you're doing. Father, receive our glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So John chapter 14, the chapter started in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. The very first part of this chapter is a transition from 1338 to 141. In 1338, he's saying, you're going to deny me, talking to Peter three times. And then he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So don't be overcome with trouble. And this trouble that it's talking about is uncertain affinity. It's not being sure of the relationship between you and God. If, if you are unsure of our relationship and you're unsure of how I'm going to respond, how I'm going to act, what are my feelings, what is my nature and my character, you're more likely to run away from me in the face of great pressure than run to me knowing that I am the security, I am the house that, you, that will cover you, I am the blessing, I am the redemption. Like Jesus is saying, if you will understand all of these truths, it will change your life. And then he goes through this discourse and he's talking about the fact that I'm leaving, I'm going to the Father. And he's saying, I'm going to send the Spirit, I'm going to send the Comforter, he's going to be with you, he's going to abide with you forever. He's going to teach you all these things that you don't understand right now. He's going to remind you of all the things that I've sat here and told you. You don't get it right now, but you will get it soon and very soon. So I want to read verse 27. Verse 27, you see this same phrase again. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. We're going to come back to that. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, when we study the Word of God, if you've been with our ministry any length of time, you understand that I'm very big on definitions. Not just definitions, because I believe definitions define what a word is. It's the point of a definition. But it's not just that. 
understanding the definition understands it gives you the the nature of something what something is defines what it, I mean if you can understand what it is it, it, it changes your whole perspective it gives immense revelation to it but even more than that not only do we talk about definitions a lot one of the things we do a lot when we study the Word of God is that if there's different phrases that means there's usually different meanings the reason why I say that is it in the Bible it talks about the washing and regeneration of the Holy Ghost. Now most people talk about that and they just skim right through and say, Jesus washes you clean. Well, yes, that's part of it. There is a washing and a regeneration. They're two separate words. How do I know? They're spelt differently. <laughs> they're literally spelt differently, which means they're two different words with two different meanings. The washing and the regeneration is not that God just washes you clean. It's that he starts you over, but he starts you over completely different than you were before. Both of those phrases. You get to start over, that's one. And the second part of it is you start over different. You don't start over born in America. You start over born in Africa. Your life would be different because, of your, because your heritage is different. You're born different. You're in a different family. It's the same thing with God. When you get born again, not only do you get a fresh start, a blank slate, not only do you get to start over, but you're starting over in a different family, which means your actions moving forward are going to be completely different. The reason why I say this, I want to, we, I'll give you another example. I'll give you these examples so you understand that when we talk about there's differences, there's differences for a reason. And I want you to understand that when you study the Bible, you need to look at these differences. If you look at Song of Solomon chapter 2, verse 5. Now, we have did a verse-by-verse -verse study on this. If you want to look at chapter 2, you'll get more information on this. But it says, Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. Now, there's two different phrases here. Three different phrases here, actually. But sick of love, talking about being lovesick. Now, there's two different, there's different ways you can define lovesick. Mike Bickle defined it as, pained by anything that would get in the way of love i define it as affection or adoration to the degree that it makes you grieve to be without jesus like you can't live without it but in the aspect of love sick there's two different phrases stay me with flag and comfort me with apples now most people put that all together and it's talking about being refreshed by the word i think that's too general especially because there's two phrases now, if you understand what flagons are, flagons are raisin cakes. And raisin cakes were used in sacrificial burial offerings. That's what raisin cakes were used for. And apples is a, is a um, direct comparison to the Word, the Word of God. You can look back at verse 3 for more information, and we have, a full te we have full teachings on this. So I'm not going to go into all of this because this is poetic and there's, there's symbolism in here. We're not going to go through all of it. But stay me also means rest. And then comfort me also means refreshing. So when it says, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love, it also can read, if you pull the definitions out, that I will rest in the sacrificial burial offerings and I will be refreshed by his word, I am sick of love. I am lovesick. I'm lovesick because I rest in the sacrificial burial offering of Jesus and I am refreshed by his word. Now, I want you to see this because we talked about this yesterday that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you now there is an aspect that the Holy Spirit will say unto you all of the things that Jesus has said I'm going to the cross these are the end time prophecies like there's a lot that goes into that phrase but one of the things I want you to understand is when you're lovesick and when the Holy Spirit is bringing all things to your remembrance. One of the greatest understandings is that what the Holy Spirit brings to your remembrance is what Jesus says about you. It's that point in the Song of Solomon where you see the affirmations. And, and of course, she's very immature at this point. But the affirmations of the bridegroom to the Shulamite, to the bride. And it's his view of her, and he calls out the budding virtues in chapter 2. The reason why I want you to see this is that this, the, the Holy Spirit's job of bringing to your remembrance what Jesus said about you. 
Now you might say, Cody, that's in verse 26. What, how, what does this have to do with verse 27? Verse 27 is peace. This word peace, now we have different definitions of how that word can be used. But if you look at the context of this, of this discourse, one of the ways I believe that it could be most defined is rest. It's one of the definitions of this word, this word peace, if you look it up in the Greek. There's other definitions for this word, but I don't think the definitions apply to the context of what Jesus is saying. Because he talks about the Holy Spirit teaching and bringing you all remembrance. So explaining what I said and reminding you of what I said. So Jesus said the Holy Spirit, two of its jobs, in the aspect of comfort. I'm the comforter, and I'm through comforting you, I'm going to tell you what he said and explain it to you and remind you. The gift of peace that Jesus is giving that the world cannot give is the rest of or the assurance, the ability to have confidence in how he sees you. And Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. That word trouble means uncertain affinity, not understanding the relationship dynamic between us. And neither let it be afraid. Two different phrases again. So two different aspects of trouble. The uncertain affinity, not understanding our relationship, and the fear that comes from great, from great trouble, from great pressure. Wars and rumors of war cause frightening, cause fright to come into you. But anxiety and worry is a different kind of trouble because that deals with the relationship. If I'm sure in our relationship, we can get through any trouble. Navy SEALs understand their dynamic between their teammates. They can go through great, great adversity and great war because they're sure of the relationship between each other. But if that relationship gets strained, or they're unsure of that relationship, it's not only going to make the relationship hard, but the battle even harder. So Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you what I'm saying. He's going to remind you of what I've said about you, and it will cause peace. This is peace that I'm giving. This kind of peace is to be able to rest in what I've said about you. And that will cause you to not be troubled, not be unsure of our relationship. The Holy Spirit's going to teach you our relationship dynamic. He's going to remind you my affirmations of you. And it will cause you to rest. And will cause you not to be frightened. And, and fright, the, the aspect of fear causes you to draw back. Causes you to stagger. Doesn't cause you to stay in faith. Perfect love casts out fear. This is what the Holy Spirit's job is. I want to keep reading. I want to try to get through these verses. Ye have heard how I said I go away and I come to you again. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now that's a powerful truth that going into the Father, actually passing out of this world and going into the Spirit and going to heaven and being with the Father. Now Jesus is in a resurrected body. It's not just Spirit. But in a glorified, resurrected body, He goes to the Father. You should rejoice. Now we've talked about that there's certain things that Jesus could not do in His natural body while He was here. Like be multiple places at multiple times. That's one thing you can't do because you've got a body. But in the Spirit, when He sends the Holy Spirit, can be with all of us. But even greater than that is the aspect of you should rejoice when somebody goes to heaven because you're going to be with the Father. It's one of the greatest things, the Ancient of Days. I mean, that's, that's a powerful truth. I mean, we're talking about being in the presence of Jehovah God. I mean, we're talking about Elohim. We're talking about the God that's never been created the father and jesus is going back home to the father we should rejoice over that not be sad that he's leaving jesus is saying if you, if you would if you love me if you really love me you would rejoice over this paul even talked about that we don't grieve like the heathen do why, well, why don't we grieve like the heathen do because we're not unsure of where we're going we are sure we're going to the father so we rejoice in that we rejoice when we get another saint over the finish line we rejoice when we get another saint into the kingdom of god now we, you know, it does, it is, it is sad in some aspects that you don't get to see them anymore, but that time that you don't get to see them is very short before, guess what? You're in the presence of God. One of the greatest things you can do is get another saint home, keeping the faith, going all the way, not giving up, going, you know, finishing their course. And now I've told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, you might believe that's, that's one of the greatest parts about prophetic scripture is that Jesus is saying this is going to happen and then it happens and it builds faith because you can trust that what he says is true. 
Everything is held together by the integrity of the word of God. God's word holds everything together because there's integrity in it. If God broke his word, everything in this world would, I guess, explode, whatever you want to call it. But everything, all the fabric of everything, I mean, you're talking about the carpet, you're talking about your chair, your body, your the air, everything is held together by the integrity that God is not a man and he should lie. God is always truthful. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this so you can have confidence in it later. And if you can have confidence in this, then you can trust whatever else I've said about you is true. If I tell you that this is going to happen and then it happens, you can also trust that when I say I love you, guess what? I love you. So Jesus is saying, and the way in which I love you and the degree in which I care about you, not only that I love you, but I like you. I delight in this relationship. I want to be with you. That where you are, that where I am, there you may be also. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, he hath nothing in me. Now we understand that Judas is scary, it's about to come, and they're going to take Jesus, and he's going to the cross, and Jesus is like, I'm not about to talk much. It's the last discourse we're going to have. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do arise, let us go hence. Jesus is saying that the world may know that I love the Father. His love for the Father, God gave him commandment, and he said, even so I do. I do what the Father said to do because I love the Father. This is a great revelation, church, that in the Old Testament, God said that if you will hearken unto my voice and do all that I command thee this day, then you will become a peculiar treasure in my sight. And that's, I, I believe, in Exodus chapter 17 or 19. When God gave the commandment to Moses at Mount Sinai. When, when the children of Israel gave up the, the freedom to go under law. It's a whole story. We're not going to get into that today. But in Titus chapter 2, the grace of God that appeareth, the grace of God hath appeared to all men. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us to deny ungodliness, worldly lust, to live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed day in the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, what it also says is that we may become a peculiar people, zealous of good works, talking about obeying the commandments of God. Jesus is saying that it's the love that I have for the Father, it's our relationship that causes me to obey his commandments. Jesus is fully God. The Father is fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully God. It's the Trinity. It's the mystery of, three, of one God and three persons. But Jesus is saying, I love him, and I will obey him. That's powerful. Like, what love causes you, what love compels you, not only to obey, but to obey to the point of death? And you can read in 1 John, where it talks about the love of God that compels you to deny, deny ungodliness. It's the love of God that casts out the, the things of this world. It's the love of God that compels you to lay down your life for your brother. There's a powerful truth in this, that it's the love of God that compels Jesus. It's his relationship with the Father that is the reason why, even so, I do. Even so, I do. Church, I just I absolutely love this. That we talk about the love of that Jesus had for the Father and the Father had for him and all the dynamics that come with that is like this is the reason that God told me to do it and I will do it not because I have to we all know that Jesus could have called down angels and taken them I mean he, he, he didn't have to do it Jesus said no man takes my life from me I lay it down willfully I'm doing this for the Father so that the Father may be glorified in the Son that what I do the Father may receive glory the entire plan of God is not servants. The entire plan of God is relationship with man. It's the greatest understanding in the prodigal son that God did not bring you back to be a servant. God brought you into the kingdom to be in relationship with him. That he is the father and you are, a, you are one of his sons. We're all the bride of Christ and we're all sons of God. Dealing with the relationship and the position of authority. 
these verses in 27 through 31, it's, there's so much powerful truth right here. One of the, I mean, the greatest truth of understanding that your heart not being troubled, having uncertain affinity, and the frightening fear, the other kind of trouble, both. You overcome both of those by the peace that Jesus gives you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Not the kind of peace or rest that the world gives that changes based on circumstance, that changes based on what you do, that changes if they're having a bad day, that changes if they don't like you. No, we're talking about peace or rest. Not that the world gives, but give I unto you that you can be certain of our relationship. You can be steadfast in the midst of great pressure. It takes the spirit to come on a man to go to the point that you die for. The spirit of martyrdom is a grace given by God. And we and maybe we'll teach a full lesson. I know we speak of martyrdom every once in a while, but the ability to not to not deny Jesus, even if they will kill you for it, is one of the greatest glories you can have. I mean, the apostles died for this, believing what Jesus said. And the glory of God came on them, and God received glory in them because of it. But I just want to tie this verse 26 to 27 one more time. That the Holy Spirit, the Father is going to send it in the name of Jesus. So teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said. He's going to explain and teach all of these things that I've already said. And he's going to remind you of everything I said. And there's two distinct differences in that. One, he's going to explain all the things that are to come and all the things that I've told you that you don't understand. There's that aspect of it. But one of the greatest ministries, one of the greatest aspects of the, of the role of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity and the role of the Holy Spirit in your life is to bring all things to remembrance. And just like in the Song of Solomon, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love, there's two aspects. It's the aspect of resting, that's the peace in verse 27, and the sacrificial offering of Jesus. And... The comfort that comes from the word or the affirmations of him. Jesus is saying, I'm giving you this peace. I'm giving you this rest. That you can be steadfast in our relationship. You can rest in the sacrificial offering that I've given you. That the Holy Spirit's going to teach you. And you can be refreshed by the word. You can be refreshed in my word. And what I've affirmed in you. Even in your immaturity. I, I recommend go back and watch our series on the Song of Solomon. There's some great things in that. But even in the midst of, of immaturity, you're a sincere believer, yet very immature. Jesus calls out the budding virtues or the seed form virtues in you. She wasn't exhibiting those. She even backed out. I mean, she, she drew back at the end of chapter 2, but he still called them out of her in the middle of chapter 2. Which means Jesus saw something in her that she didn't see in herself. And later, it did come to fullness. It budded, it flourished, it, it came forth. She got to the point where I'll never draw back. She said, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him I'm sick of love. I'm lovesick. I'm not going to draw back. I'm not offended. I'm not offended at the world. I'm not offended at him. I love him. It's one of my favorite verses in chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 8. Sick of love. I'm lovesick. All deals with this same passage right here in John chapter 14. The Holy Spirit reminding you of the affirmations of the bridegroom king to you. He's not just a king with authority. He's a bridegroom with desire. He loves you. And this, this aspect of understanding what he's done for you, the Holy Spirit teaching you, and understanding how he feels about you, the budding virtues, the affirmations of him towards you, that's the Holy Spirit reminding you, will cause peace or rest in the face of great adversity, the things that are going to frighten you, but also in the face when the devil's trying to come against our relationship, you can stand fast and stand firm. We're out of time today, church, so let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Holy Spirit, come on and in every single body. Every single person on the sound of my voice. God, teach us all the things that Jesus has said. Remind us 
of the virtues, the budding virtues, the seed form affirmations that the bridegroom does. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I love you. Have a wonderful day, and we will see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Have a great day.